morning. Good morning, everyone. My name is Kelly. I am the pastor at Edges. I got so lost in worship that I forgot it was my turn. <laughs> so, welcome. It's really great to be with you this morning, bumbling as I may be. And now I would like to begin this day with a bit of a sidebar. Um, just a quick telling of some of the things that are to come this morning. Um, at Edges, as you know, we always close our conversation with communion, a uh, time here at the table. It's time to spend with the living God at the place where grace is always offered. So we break bread together and we pour the cup. Both of those are metaphors for how Jesus offers us everything that God has to give and how that's often through ordinary elements, the stuff of this world. So later today, in this particular day, I'm going to invite us to the table, only I won't use spoken words. So I want to talk about it for a moment now. Everyone is invited always to participate because the grace of God is for everybody. So if you choose to join in this morning, you'll simply come forward at the designated time. You'll receive a piece of bread, You'll dip it into the cup. All of our bread is gluten-free. And the moment itself is actually a reenactment of Matthew chapter 26, where Jesus is talking to his disciples. It's found several other places in Scripture, but I believe that's on page 571 in the Bibles on your table if you'd like to read it during our communion time together this morning. It's a powerful reminder from Christ that God's Spirit is within us, is helping us, is shaping us. So that's coming later today, and it seemed important that we all understand it with words before we seek to participate without them. Just know that you're all welcome and invited. But for now, you've heard already this morning that the season of Lent begins this week on Wednesday. It's one of my favorite seasons. Now, I feel like I say that every time there's a new church season, but it truly is one of my favorite seasons because it's a time, a whole season that is supposed to be marked with self-reflection. And for me, self-reflection self usually means movement or change. And I'm one of those rare people in the world who loves change. I never order the same thing again at a restaurant. I've not minded it when my family has moved across the country. I just love the idea of growth and becoming and seeing and doing new things. So I shared with you a few weeks ago that I've been entertaining a change, something I've never thought about before in my 48 years of living, and that change is this. It's simply, best I know how to say it, a desire for less words. It's because I've been feeling sort of preoccupied by how out of control the world feels to me. And for me, the careening seems to be exacerbated by the proliferation and caustic spread of words. How can I say something louder than the last person? How can I say something smarter or better? How can I be more trendy or more creative? How can I steal something from somebody else without it looking like I did? How can I be more crass than the last person who mentioned the topic at hand so my post will get more attention? Words. So to me, it looks like words are our newest widespread virus. That musing has led me to think again about a scripture that I almost never trust. So I'm wondering what you think about this particular passage. To me, the passage seems like an invitation to less words. So I thought we could talk about it this morning. The irony, I know. The text comes from Romans chapter 8. That's found on page 650 of the Bibles on your tables. If you'd like to look at it in broader context this morning, it'll also appear up on the screen. First, just listen. See what you think. Romans chapter 8, verses 26 and 27. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we don't know how to pray as we ought. But that very spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. 
And God, who searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the Spirit. Because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So, I'm wondering what you hear in this claim. And then what do you wonder about? So sometimes at Edges, we start in groups, not always this early in the day. We get in groups of five or six folks. I'm going to encourage you to really get a good group, five or six folks this morning. Be sure you introduce yourselves and know each other's names, and then maybe some of you would like to share about this passage. And here's the only question. What do you hear in this claim? What do you wonder about? So your responses would start something like, I hear, or I wonder, and you're going to have four minutes to do this, so that's a lot of time. So it's okay to really dig in. All right, find five or six friends, new friends. Introduce yourselves and then see what you find. I'll call you back in four minutes. Okay, you're halfway through. We've got two minutes left. Okay, one minute. You've still got a whole minute. Keep going. Well, that has never happened before. You sound like you're ready. 
Only I'm not sure I know how to turn off the alarm. Hold on. All right, let's be ready, everyone. Come on back. You finished 23 seconds early. That's a record. It's never happened. But I am a good teacher, and I know when a lull means a lull. A lull means it's time to move on. So I asked you, what are some of the things that you heard or that you wonder? And if you can say something that your group heard or wondered in about a sentence, would you just call it out? What do you hear in that passage? What did someone in your group hear or wonder? Sadness. Sorry? Sadness. Okay, you heard sadness in the passage. Okay. It can be very difficult to be quiet. What else do you hear? What claims does it make? What do you wonder about? Encouragement, said Carol, right? Is that what you said? Encouragement. How so, Carol? Okay, that when we don't know what to pray, we're encouraged that God still knows. Wow. So the active words are helps, searches, knows, intercedes. Helps, searches, knows, and intercedes. So it's an active relationship. Oh. This group wondered if the Spirit is doing all these things on our behalf, would it tempt us to be passive? Or encourage us to be passive. You didn't say tempt. Okay, we'll go with tempt. What else? To follow up on that, it may be that there is sort of a, a freshness deep down within us that we may have to stop and experience it. Maybe it is so beautiful. Maybe there's a freshness deep down inside things, deep down inside or in the side of things. Inside. <laughs> Dean, we're giving you credit though, okay? <laughs> that there is a freshness deep down inside that the Spirit can reach. One more over here. But if words are our primary way of communicating with other humans, but with God, what if that doesn't need to be the case? It's a big thing to wonder about. Well, I hope we will all spend this week wandering around inside this passage and, and what are some of the things that it could mean. Hopefully the day will help catapult each of us on our own rabbit trails and rabbit holes. For me, I may have shared with you before, I know I've shared with you before, that I grew up in a small Texas town, a one-stop light kind of place. It was a place where neighborhoods were still meant for neighboring, where dogs and even children belonged to everybody. I spent entire summers with my ragtag little community, my band. It was loosely comprised of all children ages four to 15 who lived on our long cul-de-sac. Brent Smith was my favorite in our childhood pack. Being a boy and being really funny and being my older sister's age, he was sort of the president of our shenanigans. Brent's brother Neil was my age, but age never mattered on Saturdays when we all lined up to see who could walk the pipe that went across our creek. And if you got to the other side, we got to sit down on the curb, wait for the ice cream truck to come and share dreamsicles on the curb. Those were the day's events. So when we got the phone call in early spring, 1985, that Brent, who had been riding his bicycle home, was hit by a car that either hadn't seen or hadn't paid attention to the one stoplight in our town, our whole town. But especially those of us who lived on Westwood Circle simultaneously crumbled and also rose to the horrific occasion. 
I still remember how our pack gathered outside in Brent's backyard while all of our parents filled the inside with covered dishes and cleaning supplies. It was what we knew to do. I remember how there were seven instead of eight of us trying to force down dream sickles. And how we never mentioned to Neil or to each other that we didn't know what to do without our president. But what I remember most, even to this day, about the accident was Brent's mother. Diane Smith stood in her laundry room in front of her washing machine and dryer from the time I saw her after that phone call until the day about six days later when Wilma Bird stepped in to tell us all what was true. It seemed strange and truthfully kind of inappropriate that Brent's mom would be washing clothes at a time like this, right? But we all, adults and children alike, watched helplessly as she loaded piles of clothes in and then stood there staring through the glass hole. Does anybody remember when washing machines had a glass hole in the top? Almost nobody said yes. Anyway, it's true, they did. And she stood there staring through the glass hole. But the absolute strangest part was that Diane was neither tear-stained nor snotty-nosed. She was just flat and hollow-eyed, while the bubbles rose to drown the socks and the jeans and the cut-off shorts, until the tumbler would begin its constant and predictable rhythm, and finally the spin cycle would commence and slow the machine to a halt. Then Mrs. Smith would take the clothes out one by one and load them into the dryer, and she'd push a button and the vibrating would start, and she'd place her hands on top of the dryer, and sometimes I'd even see her with her cheek up on the machine until finally the big box would stop its shaking. And I remember that most of the adult conversation was how to get Mrs. Smith to stop, how we would get her to come sit down and let somebody else do all the chores, or about how we could convince her to rest because she didn't need to be standing up so, or about how we could get her to eat, bless her heart, because she was going to need strength for the visitation. The adults tried everything, but Mrs. Smith persisted, even rewashing some of the piles after there were no more truly dirty clothes in the whole house to wash. After several days of this, the neighbors were quite naturally worried. They were worried Mrs. Smith was losing her mind or having a real and irreversible breakdown, and they began to devise interventions. But finally, as I mentioned, when Mrs. Smith assumed her post for about, I think it was about the sixth day, Wilma Bird came up the driveway. Now, Mrs. Bird was a semi-permanent missionary, and so that meant she was our most holy and therefore our most serious neighbor, which meant none of the kids had very much to do with her if we could help it. But her daughter Valerie was in the pack. So when Mrs. Bird walked past the kids out in the driveway that day, she announced to us that we were not to worry about Mrs. Smith. It seemed strange to me then, but when I look back now, I think Mrs. Bird was simply practicing on us what she was about to say to the adults inside. You see, Mrs. Bird had the kind of authority that people usually associate with some higher power, you know, the kind of folks. And I now know that just means people who know how to see what's true. Mrs. Bird said that Mrs. Smith was not really even doing the laundry. She said what Mrs. Smith was doing was praying, and that the drowning and the spinning and the rumble of those machines were the words she was using to cry out to God. Mrs. Bird said we were going to let her use those words as long as she needed them even if she never found other words ever again. Now, I know many of us in this room have had that experience. Probably all of us have. Not the exact same specifics. But it's the experience where you find yourself in the room with death or with some other tragedy, some other crisis, 
some other horror, fear, unbelievable circumstance, and it robs you of oxygen and vocabulary and every faculty necessary that you think for remaining on the planet. And in those kind of moments, maybe the worst thing is that it seems either God is not there or God is there and is not doing one single thing to fix it. In those cases, it looks like God is either absent or unable. And who wants a God with those characteristics? It's enough to make a person lose faith. But the Bible says there are options for moments like these. Options I almost never consider. Options for when we are frustrated beyond belief, for when we are despairing, for when we are weak, when we have lost the ability to trust God to fix what seems broken. Options. Romans 8. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we don't know how to pray as we ought. But that very spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the spirit, because the spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So the author of that statement, Paul, claims in at least two biblical letters that there are moments in life, lots of them, where we lose our way, where we are afraid, where we have no words, where we simply, truly cannot know how to say or pray anything that we think will help. There are moments where all we can do is stand in front of the washer and look through the glass at the drowning, twisted, wrung out rhythms of our life. And in those moments, Paul says we have a working promise. The text, the text says it's okay that we're out of control, preferable even, that we cannot usher in the end of the spin cycle. Because that is the spot where God's spirit takes over and that spirit navigates the relationship with the only one who can stop the spinning. It's not on us. God's Spirit talks for us, finding ways to communicate our deepest pain and our greatest needs. And those real words that get said for us but not by us, those sounds that the Spirit makes on our behalf, those true intercessions are actually enough to bring us through, to bring us through the dizzying, disoriented valleys and to turn us again toward life, hope. In the case of Brent Smith, Diane's ability to receive this spirit help from God, this might be good news to some of you. Her ability to receive that help was in a great way, totally involuntary. Diane Smith stood at the washer of her life, not because she chose to, but because she was completely immobilized. She had no other choice. It was all she could do. And so in that moment, God's spirit rose up within her, and God's powerful help was available to her, and little by little, Diane Smith found that with this very real help, she could keep on living. (laughs) Don't miss this part. It was Wilma Bird, not Diane Smith, that was the spiritual saint. Diane Smith didn't turn to God's spirit because she was super holy. No, if she could have, Diane Smith would have helped herself like we often do. And if she couldn't have helped herself, she would have relied on her friends or her neighbors or her church to get her out of or at least through her terrible tragedy. 
If it could have worked, she would have found and spent any amount of money to free her from her pain and her loss. Now, please don't hear what is not being said this morning. It's true that God also uses friends and family and churches and counselors and even money to be one kind of helper in our weaknesses. But it took Diane Smith being completely immobilized and out of working options before she could receive what only the power of God's Spirit was able to do. Paul's letter to the Romans about God's Spirit helping in our weakness really does mean our weakness. That's when God's Spirit speaks on our behalf. Is it only then? You need to ask yourself that up against the scripture. And also, while deep tragedy is a specialty of the Spirit of God, Paul does not mean to indicate that God's Spirit, which we call the Comforter, has that narrow of a niche. That God's Spirit only speaks for us when we are completely immobilized. That's not what the text says. Paul says God's Spirit desires to help us wherever we are weak, not just where we are completely paralyzed. Paul says God's Spirit prays in us when we don't know how to pray as we ought. When we're praying for the wrong things or we don't know how to pray for the right things, God's Spirit steps in not just when we cannot pray at all, but when we don't know how to pray what we ought. And that Spirit prays our lives toward God's dreams. That is good news. But here's the thing about that good news. I don't think we know that. I don't think we've witnessed God's Spirit at work in our lives very often because most of the time we can employ our, employ our own forms of other help. We aren't willing where we can help it to shut up and simply stand in front of the laundry machines in our lives to look and reflect and to zip it. While God's Spirit prays the things we don't know how to pray. We don't like to think of ourselves as fragile, as people who truly do live in perpetual weakness, in need of prayers we don't even know we need, and in search of answers we cannot possibly put into motion ourselves. And so, we most often can very easily circumvent or drown out or completely miss or busy over the help God's Spirit would be through prayer. I'm not sure all that it would look like practically were we to pray by not praying. Were we to open ourselves up without words, without even thoughts, and let God's Spirit be in control of that. But I do know that this form of prayer would look a lot less like our carefully crafted words or our specific petitions or even our grandiose and flowery praise. It would look more like rest and silence and deep breaths and awareness. The trendy word for that is mindfulness. Maybe it wouldn't literally be standing in the laundry room with the machines as metaphors for the wrinkled up, twisted weaknesses in our lives. But what would it be? It might look like a few deep breaths in the shower. It could look like a silent walk on the Huckleberry Trail. It could look like lighting a candle in the kitchen, staring simply at the flame. It could be any number of things that force us to be instead of do, that force us to receive rather than create. There's a song that we sing at Edges. I think it captures the spirit of our worship today. So our team is going to come now. And a poem is going to appear on the screen for your reflection, after which you'll hear the words to this song. 
I invite you to open yourself and to reflect on the words, Spirit, lead us where our trust is without borders. <laughs> 